Good afternoon or good morning uh, to everyone, depending on where you are joining us from today. Welcome to our webinar in partnership with CDP on setting a science-based target. I am delighted to introduce to you uh, two expert speakers today. Uh, firstly, we are joined by Leah Fink. Leah is the regional lead for Commit to Action at CDP Europe. She will be showing us how to get started with SBTs, uh, including SBTI methodology, the criteria for setting SBTs, uh, the 1.5 um, degree ambition, as well as SBTs in the CDP questionnaire. Uh, secondly, uh, ECOAC's senior consultant and technical lead on CDPs, Laurie Edwards, will be talking us through his six steps to gaining confidence in your science-based targets and how to visualize your emissions reduction pathway. Uh, my name is Lucy Haynes and I'm the Senior Marketing and Communications Manager at EcoAct in the UK and I will be your moderator for this session. Uh, we will ensure that there is plenty of time at the end for your questions. Um, you will find a Q&A box on your Zoom toolbar. Please submit your questions as we go along. Uh, we are hoping for no technical difficulties, but like many of you, we are dialing in from home. So please bear with us if we have any Wi-Fi issues, but I'm sure we're all uh, very used to home working at this stage. Um, also, we will be sharing the recording after the webinar. So don't worry if you miss anything or if you have any connection issues of your own, uh, we, you won't miss out. Um, very quickly, uh, before I hand you over to your speakers. Just a very brief overview of ECOACT in case anyone is unfamiliar with us. We are a climate change and sustainability consultancy with offices in London, Paris, Barcelona, New York and Kenya. We help companies from A to zero with their climate ambitions, from measuring their emissions to setting targets to activating change in their organisations and reducing their climate impact. For more information, you can visit our website, eco-act.com, and here you can access our full A to zero program. Of course, no climate strategy should be without robust and ambitious targets for emissions reduction in line with science. Um, so I am very, very pleased to hand you straight over to Leah, who's gonna talk us through getting started with setting science-based targets. Thank you very much, Lucy, and thanks as well to ECOACT for inviting me to today's webinar as part of this year's CDP workshop series. As mentioned by Lucy, I'm part of CDP's Commit to Action team. We're working with leading companies across the world on their journey towards environmental leadership with a focus on science-based targets, as well as the RE100 initiative on committing to reaching 100% renewable electricity, EP100 on improving energy productivity, as well as EV100. Um, to mainstream electro mobility. I'm also part of the Science Based Targets Initiative's corporate engagement team responsible for the European region. And today I'm very happy to, to be here and to give you a practical introduction to the Science Based Targets Initiative, who we are, what we're doing, and an overview of the most important things you need to know when looking into setting your own emission reduction targets aligned with science. So the Science-Based Targets Initiative is a partnership between CDP, the United Nations Global Compact, the World Resources Institute and WWF. And we now count almost 900 companies that have formally committed to set science-based targets. We're also seeing more and more companies getting their targets validated and approved as science-based by the Science-Based Targets Initiative with now almost 400 companies with targets in place. And since June last year, we've been working to drive momentum in the adoption of the most ambitious science-based targets and these are the ones aligned with the 1.5 degree warming scenario. We now have 237 companies that have committed to align their emission reduction targets with a 1.5 degree future through the business ambition for 1.5 degree campaign. So I want to take this opportunity today to encourage all of you to join the campaign to show leadership leading up to COP26. And I will tell you how you can do that in a few minutes. And as part of this webinar series, and that we're part of today as well. We will also run a dedicated session on the business ambition for 1.5 campaign if you want to learn more um, about the campaign in detail and how it links to the science-based targets framework. 
So with that, let us dive into science-based targets, our topic for today. So for those of you that are not yet um, familiar with the definition of science-based targets, they are greenhouse gas emission reduction targets that are consistent with the level of decarbonization that is required to keep global temperature increase within 1.5 degree and 2 degrees Celsius, and a key tool to prepare for and accelerate the transition to a zero carbon economy. So climate science tells us loud and clear that in order to reach the Paris objective, the global economy needs to fully decarbonize um, by 2050 at the latest. So the long-term goal of reaching net zero emissions by 2050 acts as the North Star for strategic decisions, while setting short to medium time frame set science-based targets over the next five to 15 years really ensures that companies are reducing direct and indirect emissions at the pace that is needed to achieve this long-term goal. At the same time, it provides you with a robust framework to, to work into this direction, making sure that you're aligned with best practices and incentivizing short to medium term emission reductions. In addition, disclosing on your emissions and on your targets on an annual basis in our eyes is key to ensure transparency and as well accountability on that progress towards these targets and as well in order to send a very clear message to your stakeholders that you're on track towards reaching this north star of net zero emissions at 2050 at the latest. So how do you get started and how do you join the science-based targets initiative? The first step, which is voluntary for companies, is to sign the commitment letter in which you publicly commit to develop emission reduction targets that are aligned with our criteria and recommendations and that you get them validated and approved by the initiative and published on our website within 24 months or within two years. And then it, when it comes to that target development process, which can of course look very differently for each company depending on your sector and your level of maturity. But here it's really important to know that there is a lot of support available for you. So both the Science-Based Targets Initiative that has criteria and tools and guidance available on the website, as well as organizations such as EcoAct that have a long-standing experience and deep knowledge how to help your company on that individual target setting journey. So once you have developed your target, and we will look into the different steps of that um, in a minute. So once you have your targets ready, you submit them to the Science-Based Targets Initiative for validation. And if they meet our criteria, um, you receive an approval letter and the target validation report, and you then have a maximum of six months to make these targets public on our websites. With that, let's deep dive a little bit into the technical side of things. So what are the elements of a science-based target? It always starts with the global carbon budget. So how much can the world still emit? We're working currently with two climate scenarios as defined by the IPCC and the International Energy Agency. And this is really the, the starting point. So we have the global carbon budget. And then the next question is, of course, what are we gonna do with this? How are we going to allocate this global carbon budget budget across individual companies, across sectors. And this is where the science-based targets methods come into play. They are essentially allocation approaches, so methods to allocate this global carbon budget across companies. The most important ones are the absolute-based approach and the sector-based approach. And I will introduce the difference um, in a minute. And the third element then, which is of course crucial, is the company specific profile and information. So your individual carbon footprint, um, your activity data, how much are you already um, producing, for instance, today? How much are you planning to grow over the uh, target time frame? And all of these elements will shape how your individual science-based target will look like. As mentioned, and I now want to um, yeah, look a little bit closer into these two target setting methods. 
on the left here, you see the absolute base approach. It's also called the absolute contraction method. Here we ask all companies to reduce greenhouse gas emissions at the same linear annual absolute reduction rate than the IPCC asked the global economy to reduce by essentially. And I will present to you which values we ask for um, in a few slides. So here we have a linear absolute reduction and you can see that no matter from where company A, B, C, D in this graph starts that journey, they reduce at the same linear rate. On the right side, you have the sector-based approach. This is based on sector-specific pathways that are developed by the international energy agencies. And these pathways take into consideration both historical developments within that sector, as well as future projections and technological and innovation potential um, to define an intensity path that all companies within that homogeneous sector will be converging on. And to start familiarizing yourself with these methods, I want to recommend you to download our science-based targets tool from our website. It's free to download where you can model both your scope one and two targets um, for, for the absolute contraction method and for the sector-based approach if that's applicable to your sector. And there's also a tab in the Excel for scope-free target setting modeling. As mentioned, I also want to present the temperature thresholds that we're currently accepting. So this table is to be read horizontally, essentially, and the minimum level of ambition for scope one and two targets, so it's the second row in this graph, is a well below two degree alignment. So for the absolute based um, approach that I just explained, this translates into a 2.5% absolute linear reduction per year. So that's the minimum level that we ask companies to reduce by per year. And as I already mentioned, we highly encourage companies to align themselves with a 1.5 degree warming scenario, which translates into a 4.2% annual absolute reduction. For the sector, the decarbon sectoral decarbonization approach, um, the minimum level of ambition is as well, well below two degrees, which is called here the IEA beyond two degree scenario. And a 1.5 degree alignment is not yet available um, for the sector-based method as these pathways don't exist yet. An exception to that is the power generation sector where we will make the sector decarbonization approach available very shortly. And now let's look at the criteria. I want to today give you an overview of the most important criteria and at the same time encourage you to visit our website and look at the comprehensive list of criteria as they include a lot of recommendation and sector specific details which are very helpful on that journey. So the boundary criterion is, um, is asking companies to set targets that cover at least 95% of your company-wide scope one and two emissions. So you can only exclude a maximum of 5% of your scope one and two emissions combined. The time frame of a science-based targets are five to 15 years into the future from the day that you submit your targets for, the val for validation by the initiative. And science-based targets need to be forward-looking. And coming back to that uh, crucial aspect of annual disclosure, we ask companies to annually disclose their greenhouse gas emissions inventory and progress against their targets publicly. We also ask every company to conduct a full scope free screening. So across all 15 categories as defined by the Greenhouse Gas Protocol Corporate Standard. And if that screening shows that more than 40% of your total scope one, two and three emissions come from scope free, then we ask you to set an ambitious and measurable scope free target. And I will show you um, as well what we understand um, by well, what we understand under an ambitious and measurable target. But first, um, let me point out a few 
things about scope one and two targets. So I already mentioned that the minimum level of ambition for scope one and two is a well below two degree alignment. So that 2.5% absolute reduction per year or the, or the beyond two degree scenario for the sector based approach where we encourage efforts towards 1.5 degree alignment. Companies can generally choose between setting intensity targets or absolute targets, but it's important to know that intensity targets are only eligible when they are either based on the sector-based approach, if that's available to your sector, or whether if the underlying absolute emission reductions of these intensity targets are in line with the absolute contraction method. We also let companies substitute their scope two targets with renewable electricity targets if you align with reaching or if you commit to reaching 80% renewable electricity by 2025 or 100% um, by 2030, which we temperature classify as 1.5 degree aligned. Now let's look into scope three. So first of all, it's important to note that the Science-Based Targets Initiative provides more flexibility around scope three targets than around scope one and two targets, both in terms of the boundary of the target as well as um, the level of ambition. So the boundary I said for scope one and two targets are 95%. For scope three, they are 67%. So two thirds, um, your scope three targets, if you need to set one, needs to cover two thirds of your scope three emissions. The timeline is the same than for scope one and two targets, so five to 15 years into the future. An exception to that are supplier or customer engagement targets, which have a time frame of five years. And there are different options um, for companies to, to set a scope free target because we really want to enable each company to tackle their own hotspots and find and model a solution that is um, suitable for this company. So these are the three options that you have to set your own scope three target. The first one is to use the absolute contraction method here with the minimum level of ambition of a two degree alignment. So we allow as a minimum, a lower level of ambition than the minimum for scope one and two. So this two degree alignment translates into a 1.23% absolute reduction per year. The second option is to set intensity targets, which are either modeled based on the sector decarbonization approach so for setting physical intensity target or using the economic based approach, which is a 7% year on year reduction per unit of added value. And the third option is to set physical intensity, physical intensity targets, excuse me, based on a physical indicator of your choice that leads to a 2% um, reduction, intensity reduction per year. But at the same time, these targets cannot lead to absolute emissions growth. In addition, or instead of these options, companies can choose to ask their suppliers or customers to set science-based targets themselves. And actually with many companies having the lion's share of their emissions in scope free, it's great to see that more and more companies across the world start tackling this really important portion of their emissions by directly engaging and collaborating with their suppliers um, on ambitious target setting and on redu and emission reductions. And the CDP supply chain program is a great tool to do just that. So to start directly engaging with your key suppliers, understanding where they stand, collecting primary scope free data, collaborating on emission reduction targets, and of course as well track progress on your own scope free targets. And in 2019, CDP, um, the CDP supply chain program engaged more than 13,000 suppliers. So it's very likely that some of your suppliers are already providing um, detailed emissions data to CDP. So if you want to find out whether that's the case or how a supply chain membership might look like for your company, please get in touch with us. 
yeah, before I finish, I want to spend a few minutes on the business ambition for 1.5 degree campaign that I have already um, mentioned, which is an urgent call to action for companies to set emission reduction targets aligned with the 1.5 degree future. And it is backed by a coalition of United Nations leaders and business organizations across the world, as well as NGOs, uniting behind that one message that we urgently need to step up ambition for the best chance of tackling the climate crisis crisis. And this campaign is led by the Science-Based Targets Initiative in partnership with the United Nations Global Compact and the Women Business Coalition. And we're seeing that the, this transformation to a zero carbon economy that we need to see is indeed achievable and has already begun. And we're very happy that already hundreds of leading businesses across the world are striving to limit global warming to no more than 1.5 degrees. And the momentum today shows that it is possible to fully decarbonize our economy by 2050 if that's fully harnessed and supported. And we also encourage governments to take confidence from that ambition business voice and these ambitious commitments. So how can companies join the campaign? So independently from being already a part of the Science-Based Targets Initiative or not being not yet committed or having targets, um, every company joining the campaign needs to sign the business ambition for 1.5 degree commitment letter. And firstly, it is important to note that by joining the campaign, companies are committing to the Science-Based Targets Initiative and to follow our criteria and recommendations and to submit targets for official validation. So they are 100% um, building up on each other. And in that commitment letter, companies have two options to choose um, to go for, and they can also take both options for the highest level of ambition. So let's look at these options shortly. Option one is to set science-based targets across all relevant scopes in line with 1.5 degree emission scenarios within 24 months. So this ensures the strongest ambition in the short to medium term, so steep short to medium term um, reductions, and enables companies to align with trajectories that lead to net zero value chain emissions by 2050. The second option is to set a long-term target to reach net zero value chain emissions by no later than 2050, alongside science-based targets across all relevant uh, scopes. And this option ensures the strongest ambition in the long term and at the same time enables companies a degree of flexibility on the short to medium time frame on how quickly to align with these, um, with these long term pathways that guarantee net zero emissions well before 2050. So in practice, that, needs, that, that means that for option two, your science-based targets over the next five to 15 years do not need to be 1.5 aligned, but then you need to set a long-term net zero target aligned with our um, recommendations and guidance that we will publish towards the end of 2020. So lastly, I want to cover how science-based targets are integrated into um, CDP's disclosure journey. So CDP considers science-based target science targets to reflect best practice and target setting, and it's also incentivizing their adoption through scoring. Companies can report on their targets in the climate change questionnaire and questions as C4.1A and B, and they are scored both on the disclosure and awareness level and more importantly, um, guarantee you the maximum of three leadership points if you have your targets officially approved by the Science-Based Targets Initiative. For this year's disclosure cycle, you can find everything that you need to know in the 2020 CDP technical note on science-based targets. So lastly, I just want to already mention that I just want to again invite you to join our webinar on the business ambition for 1.5 degree where we'll cover the two options that I now shortly went through in a lot more detail and what that um, means for you as well as the um, related policy advocacy piece and you can register for free for these workshops at workshops.cdp.net and we're running two different uh, sessions on June 30th um, to accommodate 
accommodate for different time zones. Apart from that, um, already thank you from my side for listening to the presentation and we invite you as well to get in touch with us to set up a discussion. And um, at this stage, I also wanted to shortly remind you to use the Q&A box um, to submit your questions um, that we will cover at the end of the webinar. So thank you very much and I'm happy to hand over to Laurie. Great, thank you very much, Le, and hello to you all. So I'm Laurie Edwards, and I'm a senior consultant and SBT technical expert within the EcoAct UK team. And I'm delighted to be talking today on the steps you can take to commit and achieve your carbon reduction targets with confidence. So making a commitment to reduce carbon emissions is a very important step many companies are making as they look to transition towards a low carbon economy. Through this next section of the webinar, we're going to discuss the importance of having an effective strategy to map your pathway to achievement, giving you and your stakeholders, being internal and external, confidence in your journey to do so. So setting targets is a process that will require engagement from multiple, multiple departments within your business. Each stakeholder group is likely to have their own KPIs for measuring success against this carbon reduction target. So for example, financial returns on energy efficiency investment, a reputational boost, peer competitiveness, and lastly and possibly most importantly, carbon reduction. As a result, uh, there are common themes of questions and therefore challenges that are frequently experienced. So for example, how, how do I get internal buy-in to set this target? What actions will I need to take to achieve this? Now, how, how much will it cost us and, and what do we need to report on? And where should we focus resource as our business changes through the years? Achieving the emissions reduction target and having the answers to these questions uh, will be dependent on investigating a selection of variables and um, these include possible business uh, initiatives, um, the changing political and, and potentially social landscape, um, and of course a certain amount of financial investment. Um, so what should you as the target setting company consider uh, and what are the, the most important things that you should be keeping track of as you go through this journey from uh, committing to your target and then achieving your target. Um, and through these next uh, six to seven slides, we're just gonna go through some uh, effective steps uh, that we at EcoAct um, encourage our clients and, and companies to be considering. So firstly, oh, sorry, it's a bit of a lag. Firstly, understanding what you want to achieve through your targets is the most important step. And um, every business is different. Supply chains, service and product offerings, operational footprint all vary from business to business and from sector to sector. It's important to identify what KPIs are important for you and your stakeholders beyond the carbon reduction piece. Uh, so for example, are there ambitions to be 100% renewable electricity within your operations? Maybe there are ambitions to go further than this and include that within your supply chain. Are you under pressure to eradicate single use packaging from your product offering, for example? Or move away from plastics altogether to other packaging alternatives? Should your product be made from only naturally occurring ingredients? Or maybe it's being a market leader amongst your peers, committing to net zero goals in addition to your science-based target. It is possible that these business priorities are already contributing to the decarbonization of your business and therefore your science-based target. Making sure that these initiatives are working together rather than fighting against each other is an extremely important thing to consider. So what major challenges do you have on hitting these priorities? Um, and some common things that we see there is, is, is your data good enough to be doing so? And is it good enough to accurately track performance and enable you to substantiate the claims that you make, you're making? 
um, potentially the capital investment um, planning process within your business could hinder your ability for change. And lastly, you know, is your company growth ambitions making it seem that decarbonization is an ever increasing challenge? So what we recommend is from this very first step is just to understand where you want to get to, what other initiatives you have within the business that can contribute and work harmoniously towards hitting your carbon reduction goal. And then to assess those challenges, just to make sure that you as a business understand exactly where the challenges lie and where the mitigation actions and therefore solutions are towards hitting your carbon reduction goals. Secondly, um, and potentially most importantly, is getting to grips with the data requirements that you're going to need to substantiate the business priorities that you have and overcome the challenges so that you can hit your target with confidence. So do you have good quality data for the areas of your operations that you are targeting? Uh, does the data you are collecting support the initiatives that you have? And are you able to track and decarbonize based on your actions? So we're taking the example on the right hand side here um, and spend based data is uh, an integral first step uh, to understand the hotspots in your emissions across your value chain. Now, conducting that scope three screening, as Leah mentioned earlier, is one of the most important areas within starting to, to look at your um, value chain impact and understand where your hotspots lie. Data is often really readily available for a spend-based approach and procurement uh, departments are able to provide this to you um, very quickly. And so therefore getting an understanding of your value chain impact um, is, is a relatively simple process. However, when it comes uh, to showing emission reductions with spend data, this is where difficulties can be reached. It is only possible to reduce emissions by reducing supplier spend sometimes. And can spend data support your initiatives um, to reduce your emissions? So for example, if you are looking to uh, change materials within a certain aspect of your value chain, for example, removal of plastic packaging, can that be captured within your spend data and therefore your scope three emissions? When we consider other uh, areas of the value chain, you know, maybe um, changing the grade of material um, to something that is more um, something that is more recycled content, a higher PCR value. Are you able to track that data and that change using spend-based data and information? And lastly, maybe if you have um, ambitions to move to a better, more efficient suppliers, using spend-based data, is that a limiting area to um, make it harder to track and substantiate your claims? So when we consider um, other data sources and we go up the, the graph on the right here to more industry and activity data, um, which is often seen as the main focus area for data collection, or even better, supplier data, we see an increase in effectiveness. Emissions calculations tend to be more accurate and have a higher connectivity to emission reductions that ha have an ability to influence. So as we move further away from uh, supplier, uh, so from spend data towards supplier data, we see an increase in confidence in the emission reduction claims we are making, and also the ability to track and achieve our goals. So making sure that your data is appropriate to the goals and priorities is essential, and it's a very essential first uh, first step to making sure that you can hit these goals with confidence. The next section of data collection that is needed to be mastered is from your facilities and your value chain partners to understand what actions you can be taking to reduce your impact. Not just with what actions they are, but how much energy or activity these actions might save and an indication of how much that will cost. Um, so in the example shown, um, we're taking more a look here at facility data. So scope one and two. Um, and we have an example uh, here of energy reduction possibilities at a, at a Bristol factory. How much do they cost and what are the financial impacts is a very important thing to be looking at. Once you understand what is available and what sort of technologies can be put in place, what level of deep carbon reduction will be possible based on those initiatives identified. Also, we would highly recommend the use 
the collaboration within the business here. Um, you might have similar facilities around the world or uh, similar problems being experienced in different areas of your, um, your operations. So being able to knowledge share uh, and share your, um, your, your work and your initiatives across the business could significantly help you solve these problems in areas of your operations. So once we've understood our data and once we've understood what our, um, our baseline emissions are, we've got a real good sense of mastering that information so we can track against our performance and substantiate the claims we would like to make. The next thing that we would recommend is to start to project forward from current day and understand the action plan that you need to be following to hit your target. And the first thing there is to understand how your emissions might change over the course of your target. And what we call this is defining your, your business as usual or your baseline. During this process, you, know, you should account for wider business strategy. So for example, are there organic growth projections that are going to lead to an increase in emissions if you don't take any action? Are you planning on opening any new facilities or introducing new product lines and or services? Um, but equally, account for plans to consolidate operations or close certain facilities for newer, more efficient alternatives. It is also worth considering external factors that can contribute to your decarbonization that are outside of your control. So for example, how is the, electri ele the electricity mix within your operational geography is going to change through time? over that short to medium term that your science-based target is over. And therefore, how much natural reduction uh, within your scope two might you be able to claim and see during your target, um, target timeframe? And as I said before, this is what we uh, call as defining your, your business as usual. And really, this is your baseline from which you want to now start pulling different levers to reducing your emissions. So once we have that business as usual pathway established, it is time to start looking at your reduction action plan. It is important to focus on where emissions are material and where reduction technologies are available. Identifying emission hotspots within your value chain is a great place to start and to understand what level of decarbonization is possible. And what we mean here is identifying, let's say we're within we just take scope one and two as a, as a um, separate target. Whereabouts in your scope one and two do those material emissions lie? Where are you going to see a huge reduction in emissions if you are to carry out a certain action against potentially looking at smaller areas of your scope one and two emissions where an action could have a, a great effect um, in terms of energy efficiency potentially, but not as much of a larger effect on carbon emissions. So really identifying those hotspots in your value chain is a great place to start. From these emission hotspots, we can then start to scenario plan what level of reduction is feasible and what emission reduction levers you have at your disposal to achieve that carbon reduction. It is also really important to account for and, under, and understand the interdependencies between your reduction options. So for example, um, maybe you are considering phasing in 100% electric vehicles, maybe by 2030, potentially by 2040. What impact might this have to your future emissions? And how does that compare to a commitment of 100% renewable energy for your direct operations on, along the same time frame? And what happens if you implement both? And does it make a difference which order those initiatives are implemented? to realize the emission reduction of the times over the time scales of your target. These are all questions which um, within the sustainability teams and facility management engineering teams within your business, you, you're all going to be asking yourselves as you address a science-based target and being able to understand these at the point of commitment and within your action plan is very important. So by building up this backlog of initiatives and understanding the level of decarbonization available, you'll be able to build up a heat map of possible um, actions uh, for your consideration. Okay. 
So once you have your reduction plan laid out in terms of levers, the next step is to refine this down and build up your strategy. And when we say building up, you know, bottom up assessment, what can you do where and what's going to give you the best return? So using decision making tools such as marginal abatement cost curves can start to build you a picture of where you can achieve the biggest bang for your buck across your value chain. So if we look at the example on the right here um, and reading this chart for a particular facility, we can see that the renewable electricity contract is the largest carbon saving out of all the initiatives. But it comes at a cost for every ton of carbon saved. Um, likewise, the cogeneration project, that was going to save you just under 2,000 tons of carbon a year. However, it's going to come at a cost of $100 per ton. <laughs> On the other hand, some smaller, less capex heavy projects, like the ones in the bottom left, the humidification system upgrade, the LED project, they're gonna deliver carbon savings each year and a return on your investment. Um, so therefore we're saving money for every ton of carbon that we're saving. And that is over the lifetime of your target. So if possible, by carrying out these assessments at an asset or a business level, and building up that bottom-up assessment, what we're able to then do is understand and identify how much carbon can be saved and is achievable to save and the most cost-effective way of doing so. By plussing them all, these all together, aggregating them up, we can then get an indication um, of how much at a group level the target is feasible, achievable, um, and an understanding um, of cost and other metrics to support your group objectives. And that's what we display here in our final step. You know, we're gaining approval and taking action. So we can see here, having assessed our carbon hotspots and understood the most cost-effective way to reduce these carbon hotspots areas across our value chain, we can now define and set our strategy to hit the reduction goals. Um, and present this to our internal decision makers to show the steps that need to be taken to achieve this carbon reduction goal with confidence. So what we um, recommend to our clients to do is uh, look at some other metrics as well as the carbon reduction when presenting this information. So for example, how much investment is required from a, a, a capital point of view? Um, how are our changes to our operational expenditure likely to change over the course of our target? And as a result, what is the cost of carbon for this project and for this initiative? And that's going to help support the approval process and also add to target governance. So when we look at the example shown on the right hand side here, we can explore the journey a company has taken uh, to reach the company's carbon reduction goals. Uh, firstly, the company's baseline shows that through a combination of growth, consolidation, and greening, they are likely to see a reduction of roughly 15% by 2035. Next, projects and initiatives that have been approved, um, such as 100% procurement of renewable electricity, maybe some small-scale efficiency initiatives, results in a reduction from that baseline, but at the moment not sufficient enough uh, to see the achievement of that 1.5 target shown. The assessment of additional carbon reductions, such as changing plant or decarbonization of processes, is required to reduce carbon in line with that science-based rate. Um, these projects may have longer payback periods, um, so identifying the need early is essential for company planning and sign-off. In this case, what we see is the cost of carbon is increasing from a 178 pound per tonne saving of carbon within the approved projects to a 92 pound per tonne of carbon, say um, cost of carbon per tonne saved. So we're seeing an increase in the amount of investment required there. And that's an important metric, an important message to be telling to uh, the business um, decision makers. Lastly, we've put in there the net zero assessment, which assesses the additional requirements to hit net zero emissions on top of your decarbonization. So as your business transitions towards your target, uh, um, we can then see where potential 
peer assessments and leading initiatives can be taken and what sort of cost that might have. But when we're looking at this, it's always very important to keep in mind that the time frame of these targets is on the, the medium and you know, depending on your, your assessment of, um, of time frame, medium to a longer time frame here. Um, there may be an emission reductions that you currently um, don't understand how that might be reduced. Um, and so you might have uh, an emissions gap, but that known unknown is a very important metric to understand. And as your business transitions towards your target, it is likely that carbon reduction technology and also options available to reduce that carbon is going to change and you're going to have more options available to you. So it's very important to remain agile and to operate good target governance that can adopt to these technological changes, enabling you to continue to hit your targets with confidence throughout the years. So thank you very much for your, for your attention. Um, I'm going to hand back over to Lucy um, for the Q&A session. Thank you very much, Laurie. That was a really, really interesting uh, run through of your six steps there. Um, I'd now like to invite all of our speakers to uh, turn on their cameras uh, and we'll roll into our Q&A session. Uh, we've had a, a lot of questions, a lot of really, really interesting questions, actually. Um, uh, firstly, quite a few companies are sort of asking about the fact that if there's no sector-based approach for their company, um, what should what should they do? And, and can you please explain when an intensity target can be set? Uh, perhaps, Leah, I'll hand uh, that over to you. Thanks, Lucy. Yeah, happy to happy to answer that. Um, so. Companies can generally choose between using the sector-based approach and the absolute-based approach, um, but the sector-based approach is only available to some sectors, which are the ones where the International Energy Agency provides these mentioned pathways for. These are typically um, heavy-emitting, homogenous um, sectors like steel, cement, pulp and paper. Important to note here is however that every company can use the absolute construction method with one exception of the power generation sector which is asked to use the sector-based approach but for all other companies the absolute based approach is generally suitable and um, I also quickly glanced at a related question on sector-based approach for the retail sector, um, which is not available in that sense, which I think also makes sense given what I just explained, because the retail sector is actually a quite, quite diverse sector. And we've seen quite a many retailers setting targets using the absolute based approach. And of course, here scope free and start to work with your suppliers plays an important role um, in the retail sector. So um, yeah, that as well would be the absolute contraction methods, method. Great, thank you, Leah. Uh, another common question is um, a lot of companies are sort of high growth companies uh, and they're wondering sort of how they can approach a science-based target. Uh, perhaps Laurie, you'd have some insight on, on this particular one. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, obviously when setting science-based targets, the SBTI criteria and adherence with those criteria is the number one thing. Um, we, we need to make sure that uh, the targets being set are aligned either to a, well, at least a well below two degree C pathway um, and using the methods that Leah just describes. Um, but what we would recommend, and especially if you're in a high growth area and a high growth sector or company, is to consider um, decoupling your growth from your carbon emissions understand if you're financially going to be growing at let's say three or five percent per year does that directly relate to your carbon emissions are you likely to see the same amount of growth there um, often these two areas are, are slightly uncoupled from each other you know if we are if we're growing at a, at a certain percentage but keeping our operational footprint at the same you know we're delivering more value as, as a company, we're creating a, a higher financial returns, but our footprint is staying the same in terms of an operational piece. So it is able to decouple these. And at the same time, understand through projecting your baseline emissions where those emission hotspots might change. 
are you going to see a, a growing hotspot in a certain area with your value chain or maybe a decreasing in one piece and then understand what level of of lever reduction as we talked about during um, uh, the six step stage to understand what areas of those um, emissions and and levers you can pull uh, to reduce those and mitigate the results and the impact of that growth. Great, thank you, Laurie. Um, another very interesting question. Um, does it matter what size of company you are? Uh, someone has asked um, whether there's sort of an SBT light uh, for SMEs. Perhaps Leah, are you able to take that one? Yeah, sure, happy to. Um, yes, there is. There is, um, and it's very new. So I'm glad this question was asked. Um, we have a new SME route that was launched a few weeks ago, which is applicable to um, small to medium sized enterprises, which we define as having less than 500 employees and not being out of the financial or oil and gas sector, which are exceptions. So for all other companies with less than 500 employees, we have a new streamlined route and a simplified route where companies join the initiative directly by signing a target setting letter. So it's a bit of combination between the commitment letter and the target validation letter. And SMEs can then choose between off the shelf target setting options, one um, for well below two degrees and one for 1.5 degrees. And for scope free, we do not ask for a quantified, a specific quantified scope free target, but strongly encourage companies to use the available target setting methods and to set um, what well, to set the internal scope free targets, but this off the shelf um, wording, so to say, says that the um, that the company will work to measure and reduce their scope free, okay. and this is also um, yeah due, like attached to a lower target validation fee. Great, good to know. Thank you very much, Leah. Um, Another question, uh, people have been asking a little bit about renewable energy. Uh, does uh, an SBT account for power purchase agreements, RECs and renewable, contra uh, renewable energy contracts? Uh, does that count towards a renewable energy target? Um, I suppose this could possibly go to either of you. Uh, Laurie, perhaps if it's your turn, I'll <laughs> bat that in your direction. Yeah, sure. So. Um... Within your renewable energy strategy, if it is adhering to the good quality criteria of the GHG protocol, um, uh, their scope to guidance, um, and uh, yes, you know, we, if, if your contractual instruments are the correct vintage um, and also from the correct market, then you are accounting for those renewable electricity um, procurement in, in the best practice way, then yes, there's, uh, there's no reason why um, PPAs, um, uh, procurement of, of renewable attribute certificates um, or you know, direct line renewables cannot be used towards your, your scope to 100% renewable target. Um, I think it is, it's about the accounting mechanism more necessarily than the, uh, uh, you know, the, potentially the technology or um, the areas that you are, are sourcing that generation from. Uh, Leah, I'm not sure there's anything you want to, to add to that. I think that was well covered. Thanks. Um, and what about offsets as well? That's another question that's come off, come up, whether they count to your SBT. Leah, do you want to take that one? Yeah, the short answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> they do not count towards uh, reaching a science-based target. Okay, great. Um, what else have we got? Um, so will you be mandating uh, 1.3, uh, 1.5 degree ambitions for those companies who, who are already sort of an SBTI member, uh, but have a, a lower ambition? That's probably one for you again, Leah. That is um, a difficult question to answer because we're in the here and now today with the climate science that is available to us. And we, had to, we have taken as an initiative the deliberate decision to allow this well below two degree alignment, especially um, well represented as well through these two options, for instance, to align with a 1.5 degree future, because for some sectors, short to medium time frame, steep decarbonization is more feasible than to others. 
So for us, it's really about on the long term decarbonizing as much as possible. And this well below two degree alignment might mean that you um, start that journey with a lower reduction rate. And that essentially just means that you need to do more later. So um, at the moment, our framework represents that thinking. One important aspect is uh, maybe that in our latest criteria, version four um, that came into force last year, we introduced a new criterion that ask companies to revisit and if necessary, revalidate their science-based targets every five years, starting from 2025. So in 2025, all companies with approved targets will be asked to update their targets. Um, and that might, or is likely to, um, to affect companies with two degree aligned targets, because there we already know that we no longer accept a two degree alignment. Right. Okay. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, I've got one question here about scope three. Um, obviously, this is the a challenging aspect uh, of target setting. Uh, someone's actually likened it uh, related uh, reduction targets in scope three to being a bit like chicken and egg. Um, what's the best way to start looking at how to re reduce your scope three emissions? I would imagine both of you have got some insight on this. So perhaps I'll, I'll uh, hand over to Laurie to give his thoughts. So I'd say that the first and most important thing is to identify the, the hotspot areas within your scope three. Um, so the SBTI criteria says that your scope three target must cover 66% of your total scope three emissions um, or two thirds. So um, there may be aspects of your scope three emissions that are just you know, really difficult for you to, to think about how you might be able to reduce those and, and quite far out of your control. But if they are more of the, the smaller aspect and the, the smaller materiality, then it's okay to, uh, to move those outside of the scope of your scope three targets. One of the main things that I'd recommend definitely when, when looking at scope three is to consider what areas of your value chain are gonna have higher overlaps and, and synergies with um, other um, priorities within your business and what what is your scope three target how are you going to be able to communicate that to have a really good understanding with your consumers and potentially your supply chain because this area is you know let's say if we're in the um, the sector of producing um, electrical goods and electrical products maybe tvs or something like this um, being able to have a, a scope through that, that is directly related to the decarbonization of your goods that you are selling that is likely to really resonate with your um, your consumer groups and if it resonates with your consumers then that might have competitive advantage for you um, and therefore raise um, your investor profile your stakeholder confidence in your targets etc so i'd really recommend kind of focusing on what's important to you and also your stakeholders and and what you want to achieve through your scope through target once you understand what you you want to achieve you can then understand the areas of scope three that you really need to focus on and which levers you need to pull is that within upstream does that lie with your suppliers in which case is it a um, change in your product design or the way you operate to to drive that down or is it engaging with your suppliers to see exactly how they can decarbonize you know one of the routes we discussed earlier was potential renewable energy within your value chain that could be a route that you could explore um, so, you know, recommendation, recommendation would definitely just really think about what you want to get out of your targets first before thinking about how you can reduce it. And that might simplify the way you look at things. Great. Thank you, Laurie. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. I realize we've had a lot of questions. We've not managed to get to all of them. Uh, if your question hasn't been answered, um, we will make sure that um, we follow up with you in the next uh, few days to provide you with a, with a comprehensive answer and any information, further information that you might need. Um, it just leaves me to say thank you very much to Laurie and to Leah for their expertise today. Uh, thank you also to Joe, who's been in the background, making sure everything uh, te techie-wise runs smoothly. Uh, and thank you to everyone who's joined us here today. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.